Okay, welcome back to hour two of the Army here at Prescott High School, Junior ROTC. We have Lieutenant Colonel Dan Hink from Phoenix, Army Junior ROTC, and he's based order with the Army organization and some of his experiences. Everybody give a round of applause, please. Yeah. All right, well, when we stopped in the last class, we were talking about the branches of the Army and how the branches of the Army basically structure the military, especially the Army in general. And like I said, I'm an infantry officer. These little cross rifles on my collar and if I'm using infantry, that means, as we talked about the last period, I'm an earth pig, a ground pounder, uh, a grunt. These are all the pejorative terms that everybody else uses for us that we, uh, we're used to. But the bottom line is the infantry, armor, artillery, all these branches here are called the combat arms. And in the Army, these are the branches that essentially fight with the enemy. Now, it's always a little tricky to sort of define that because they don't always do it all the time. They have other responsibilities. But ultimately, we talked about in the last class called the tip of the spear, where there are certain elements of the military, in the Army anyways, that engage the enemy. They don't always do it, but they do parts of it. Infantry, pretty much always. Armor, pretty much always. Field artillery, pretty much always. Air defense, we talked a little bit about that. Really, these days, like we said in the last class, uh, air defense is really taken care of by the Air Force. They are the best people to deal with other enemy aircraft. And often the air defense artillery, that is a ground-based force, works for the Air Force. When they go into Iraq or Afghanistan, air defense forces, of which there really aren't any to worry about, work for the Air Force. So there's a good coordination between whatever goes up in the air is maintained and developed by, and supported by the Air Force. Army aviation. We have a very large aviation element in the Army. As a matter of fact, as Colonel People said, uh, we have more pilots in the Army than they do in the Air Force because we have thousands of helicopters. Many and most of our pilots are warrant officers. They're not commissioned aviators, as we call them. They are the difference between sergeants and officers are called warrant officers. Any, are you familiar with that at all? Have you heard that term? Okay. Tell them about it. In the Army, warrants are technical experts. We have in many cases, warrant officers who are, say, an expert in, or they were sergeants in personnel, or sergeants in medical areas, or sergeants in intelligence, or even sergeants in special forces. And they move into a next category called warrant officers. It's a long, involved, sort of technical term, but commissioned officers, like myself and the colonel, hold a commission from the, United, from the President of the United States operating on his authority. A warrant held, holds a warrant to operate as an officer, and those are the terms, commissioned versus warrant, and he operates in a more, in a more limited legal status as an officer, but he is an officer, he or she, and many of our pilots are warrant officers, and what is their specialty? Well, obviously flying, but we have other kind of warrants, they do medical stuff, they do uh, intelligence, we have a number of uh, intelligence warrants, who are very, very technical areas like signal intelligence or photo intelligence. These kind of areas are uh, highly technical. Uh, communications, signal warrants. A lot of communications warrant officers are getting very technical in their areas. And we have special forces warrant officers. Special forces is a unique branch. Um, it's a very, it's kind of a glamorous thing in some ways, although once you get into it, it's not so glamorous. But how many of y'all seen Call of Duty games or the, the video online games? Yes, okay. Yes, everyone's Delta Force or everyone's a Green Beret or everyone's a SEAL. Of course, there's about that many of them in the actual existence. But in the Army, we call them special forces. Why? They're special. Why? Talk. Guys talk. But you know how much people are in. Well, because they're different, really. <laughs> I mean, and what's well, the word? There are the conventional forces, and then there are the special, special forces. And they, do they do the same thing that the conventional forces do? No, they do special things. <laughs> But I don't want to make it sound too weird. But I, I was in Special Forces for a number of years. I am not Special Forces qualified, which is different. I am an Army Ranger, and I spent many, many years in the Ranger battalions. And if we get enough time, we'll go through that presentation. But the Rangers are, are, a, are a crossover between Special Forces and conventional forces. They operate, as we say, both in the dark and in the light. The dark side is like... You know, the mission to take out Osama bin Laden. There are conventional forces and then there are covert forces. 
When we do covert operations, we call that the dark side. When we do operate in the, in the light or conventional forces, we call that the vanilla or the light side. The rangers cross over. Special forces stays pretty much on the covert side, but they do a lot of political things too. Special forces are a very misunderstood branch. They are technically not fighters. They're not designed to be fighters. That's not their job. Most of them are senior NCOs with a great deal of experience in their technical areas. And I won't go into it because it's a, it's a whole brief in and of itself. But it would be a waste of time to take a, a, a sergeant first class or a master sergeant with 20 odd years of expertise in engineering or communications or medical training and send them out there as a trigger puller. That's a waste. That's not what they're designed to do. You know, a bunch of young, charge, hard charging, 18 year old, 20 year old rangers are designed to do that. They're designed to fight and attack. The Green Berets are really trainers in many cases and to work with foreign services called FID or Foreign Internal Defense. It's one of their many missions. But they were designed really back during the Vietnam era to really work with indigenous forces. They worked with the Vietnamese, the Montagnards, and others. And they've expanded their mission greatly, but they can certainly fight and they're very good at it, but that's a waste of their talents. That's not what they're designed to do. Over in, in Afghanistan right now, they work with the local tribes people, try to work with them. That's their job. They all learn languages. On a special forces team of 12 men, you might have as many as eight to 10 languages that these guys speak. So they can send off in the darkness and they can talk to the people that they're dealing with or work it out. There was a, when the first few teams wound up in Afghanistan, they had this one team that spoke French, Russian, and German, and a little bit of Spanish. Well, they didn't have anybody that spoke Pashtun, which is the main language of Afghanistan, but they did have a, a, a guy who was a Pashtun speaker, but he spoke Russian. Well, they also had a guy who spoke French. So the guy who spoke Russian spoke Pashtun to the French guy, and the guy on the Special Forces team who spoke French talked to the guy who spoke French, who talked Russian, who spoke Pashtun. So there was a kind of a spread around, and that's how they did it. There was also a lot of pointing and talking and drawing pictures in the dirt. That's another trick. We call that pointy talky. This here, go there. Okay, got it. And it's amazing what you can do when you point and say, do a lot of hand gestures. It's funny. <laughs> but it works. It's, I've done it a lot. Okay, so these are the combat arms branches of the United States Army. These are the support branches. Now, do these all folks all fight? No. If they have to, they do. They certainly do. They are designed to fight and they are trained to fight, but that's not their primary mission. This guy, for example, the Corps of Engineers, I want him to build me a bridge. If he's fighting, is he building me a bridge? No, he's fighting. I want him to build me a bridge. So what are we, what's the infantry guy designed to do? Keep the enemy off him so he can build my bridge, so I can get the heavy vehicles across the bridge. Chemical Corps, what's Chemical Corps? Chemical Warfare. Absolutely. Is that pretty nasty? Yeah, it is. There is probably nothing nastier than chemical warfare, and it, I won't even get into the story. There's a lot. Who volunteers for that? Actually, some guys who like that kind of stuff. I mean, there are some strange people, but <laughs> chemical warfare is one of the nastiest and ugliest forms. You have to go all the way back to World War I when there was a lot of chemical warfare. Chlorine gas, and we all have pools. You know what chlorine gas does? Is chl chlorine gas is really nasty. I was a pool cleaner for years in high school and college. But chlorine is heavier than air. So what's it do when it blows along the ground? And if it drifts down, where does it go? If it's heavier than air, where, where does it look for? Trenches. Trenches. In World War II, it was really nasty. They would set it up as long as the wind was blowing in the right direction. It would creep across the ground, drop down into the trenches where the guys were all sleeping, and suffocate them. It was nasty stuff. Same with mustard gas and other forms of gas. The problem is, the wind's blowing the right direction the first half hour, and then what happens? Yeah, it comes back on you. It's very hard to aim the wind. We've discovered that. It's also, the chemical core also deals with uh, chemical, uh, radiological stuff, nuclear weapons is their area, as well as biological warfare. Now, biological warfare is absolutely prohibited by the, some of the conventions, not the Geneva, but some other ones. But we've all agreed we will not send anthrax to people, or we will not look for ways to transmit the bubonic plague. It's also very hard to aim a germ. We've discovered that. How do you force a germ to go at the enemy? You don't. What, why, what usually happens? It comes back at you. So this is one of the reasons that we don't have a lot of real uh, chemical issues, but Saddam Hussein was known to have a large stockpile 
of chemical weapons. Now, many of them were destroyed, but he still had a few of them. They found them. Uh, it, it was a, a serious danger, and there's a lot of concerns about that. The only other thing about chemical warfare, it's really funny. In World War I, there was huge chemical, chemical warfare. Chlorine gas, mustard gas, uh, nerve agents, which will kill you in about 10 minutes and just shake yourself to death. But why was there no chemical warfare in World War II? And there really wasn't any. Anybody know why? It's really interesting. Anybody heard the story? This is one of those things you can test your history teacher on. Adolf Hitler was the leader of the German army, or you know, the, the, the Nazi, Nazi party and the German army. What kind of casualty was he in World War I? When he fought in World War I. What kind of casualty do you think he was? Exactly. He was, he was almost blinded by mustard gas. And he so hated that, that even though the Germans had some very powerful chemical weapons, and they did, and they produced a form of sarin, which is called, it's just a nerve agent, it probably would have killed thousands of people. He so hated chemical warfare that even when they were being defeated, he refused to release the chemical weapons that he had to be used. And they can be done. They can be sprayed by aircraft. They can be put in artillery shells and fired. They just explode all of it. But he wouldn't do it. And that's, that's interesting because he was, didn't seem to mind much other stuff that was bad, but Hitler so hated chemical warfare and chemical weapons that he was not willing to release them. And he did not which was great because the casualties, which were bad, would have been much worse. Military police, that's pretty obvious. What do they do? Police. Police. But their biggest job in the, on the battlefield is to take care of prisoners of war. Their job is to take prisoners of war, keep them under control, not let them get injured, protect them in some ways. Because what's one of our best sources of military intelligence? Interrogation. Interrogation of prisoners of war. I don't know if you all heard, there was a story during the early parts of... Uh, the Iraq called Abu Ghraib. Have you heard that prison story? It was a story of many, many Iraqis were in this prison called Abu Ghraib. It was a military prison that the U.S. had run, but it was an old Iraqi prison. It wasn't very well taken care of, and there were some abuses done there, and it was a nasty, nasty story. This, unfortunately, fell on the military police. They did not do what they should have done, and some people got in trouble. Some people got court-martialed. Uh, one general got relieved. And then lastly, military intelligence, which is how we get our information. And as there's an old joke about that, military intelligence is a contradiction in terms. Uh, yeah, but they do a lot of valuable stuff. What they provide to provide us in the, in the combat arms is to tell us what is the enemy going to do? What do we project that they're going to be involved with? Where are they going to attack from? In what strength? What is their plan for the next 24, 48 hours? Where do we think they're going to be so we can affect their capacity to attack us? It's a tricky business. It happens to be taught down at Fort Huachuca, down there at Sierra Vista, right on the Arizona-Mexico uh, border. Uh, and it is a very, very technical, technical branch. It's where all the secret stuff goes on, all the forms of intelligence. And there are numbers in many, many agencies that deal with intelligence in the United States. What's one of them? CIA. CIA. What kind of intelligence does the CIA deal with? Not so much, actually. What is, what, what is the form? There are, there are three types of intelligence. Anybody know what they are? Just kind of guess at them. Yes? Cyber? Like okay, there's one that's called signal intelligence. What's another one? Human. Human, that's called humid, or human intelligence. What's the third one? What, what do our satellites do? Pictures. Pictures. Photo intelligence. That's the three. Photint. It's a, these are terms, photo intelligence, human intelligence, and uh, signal intelligence, or cyber also, that's what they do. And who, what does the CIA mostly deal with? They deal with one of them primarily. Human. human. They are the workers of spies and agents. There's another organization you may have all heard of called the NSA, the National Security Agency. They are the experts in the other two in terms of photo and signal. There's the thing about Osama bin Laden never talked on a cell phone. You know why? Because we do attract them that way. Exactly. We can just about monitor any cell phone on the planet. So think about that when you're talking on your phone. <laughs> if we want to. Now, inside the United States, that's a whole other issue. But we, can we take pictures of, can we read your license plate from space? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can tell the tail numbers of aircraft sitting on the ground somewhere in Russia. And wh how many and what they do. We have the ability to do that now. Some of it's limited. Now, there is a civilian. I mean, you've all looked at Google Earth, right? 
Have you all looked at, the, looked at your house on Google Earth? Sure. You know, is it pretty darn realistic? And can you have a good house? Now, you don't see it real time. What's really interesting is real time intelligence. You can have a satellite watching people walk on the ground and do things. There is a story right now when, when the SEAL team was at Osama bin Laden, they had positioned the satellite directly over that. And President Obama, there's even a picture of it, the secretary, were watching real time on the ground as that helicopter crashed and the SEAL team was moving in and around, taking out Osama bin Laden. And they could see it real time. Those are Air Force satellites. Those are Air Force satellites. Air Force drones. Right. Air Force, <laughs> well, there are other drones, but the Air Force ones a lot. But yes, Air Force is responsible for space. That is, they now, I think they're moving on to what call themselves Space Command. And, and there are things that, that the Air Force, by necessity, moves outside of the atmosphere and moves into space. You know? So if any of you read science fiction, somehow the Navy seemed to squeak, sneak their way in there. But primarily, at this point, it's still the Air Force. But these are our support branches, and they help the combat arms do what they're supposed to do. And then lastly, we have the service support branch that gets a little involved. And these are everybody else. And these are really the vast majority of the United States Army. You've got Adjutant General Corps. What do you think that might be? Just guess. Adjutant General. Adjutant General? No, no, nice try. <laughs> good, good try. <laughs> Thank you for playing. Paper pushers. You gotta have paper, don't you? You gotta have paper. Can you exist without paper? Do we need forms? Do we need hard drives? Yes, yes. yes. You gotta have records, you all have transcripts, you all have, yes. The Adjutant General Corps, uh, you know, it's all about the paper. It's all about, it, and it, it, they are the keepers of the paper, our records, our, all our stuff. Finance Corps, that's really complicated. Finances. Yeah, what do they do? Money. Pay me. Give me and the Colonel money, because we want to get paid. Actually, Finance Corps is a little more than that, it's really interesting. They are the, also the contractors for the military. One of, my, one of my things I did when I was in the Army, when I was a major, I was an aide to a three-star general, and he was tapped to become the commander for the Rwandan relief efforts. I don't know if you all remember this, but there was a genocide a few, number of years ago, back in the early 90s, in a place called Rwanda, Central, Central Africa. And we went down there, we arrived in a Learjet with me and two other security guards, and me and the general sent in on the airport going, where is everybody? Well, they got, the, air, the aircraft got lost and flew into the wrong airfield. So we were standing here in the middle of Kigali, Rwanda, with dead bodies piled up on the airfield going, and this isn't good. Well, the first guy that landed right after we got there, when this finally this aircraft showed up, was a finance guy with a briefcase handcuffed to his wrist. Guess what in there? What was in there? Money? Yeah, $3 million in cash. And right next to him were two armed guards, and right next to him was a contracting officer. We needed to buy land, we needed to buy places to put things, cars, hotel rooms, food, and guess who does all that? The finance guy has the million do $3 million in the briefcase, and the contractor writes the contracts. And these are the most, I hate to say it, so a couple of the first guys on the ground in Iraq were contractors. What do you got to do? You want stuff, what do you have to pay? Usually American dollars. They take credit cards? Not in Rwanda they don't, you know. They're all dead. So the, the bottom line was, I hate to say it, I hate to, they wanted cash and they wanted American dollars. So it was a very, they were like some of the first guys on the ground were these finance folks, just to try to get the money sped out and the contractors and done legally. Because this guy handed out these millions of dollars and he did hundreds of thousands of dollars in the first two weeks. He's got to account for it because they don't want to think it just went to a Swiss bank account. It actually got paid to somebody that we wanted it paid to. So this is an interesting little branch, very small. All the officers and people are very highly technical. Some of them are, are CPAs, public accountants. Very, very valuable group of people. Very useful. Quartermaster. What's quartermaster do? They modify and distribute weapons. Mm, close. Where did the name come from? I, somebody asked me that. Almost all of our traditions. This is a good question, sir. Where was quartermaster? Where quartermaster. Was we get almost all of our traditions from the British. I hate to say it. We're stuck with the Brits. That's the way our rank is. He's got eagles on his shoulder. That's why I have oak leaves on my shoulders. Why do I have silver oak leaves when a major has gold oak leaves? Is not gold more valuable than silver? So it should be the other way around? Why is that? Because the British are crazy, that's why. I mean, <laughs> there's no other answer. We get our stuff, money of our traditions, from the British, and that's just the way it is. Who knows? Why is a lieutenant general... Is a lieutenant, who's, who's higher in the rank structure? A lieutenant or a major? Major. 
Major. Major. But on the general ranks, a lieutenant general outranks a major general. Why is that? Because the Brits are crazy. Because the Brits are crazy. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know. We, don't, it's just, we just took them. We got stuck with them and we've lived with them ever since. Quartermaster are the guys who give us stuff. They're the stuff people. They toilet paper, uh, you know, fuel, gas, a lot of stuff. They are the log logisticians. Ordnance is what you were talking about. Ordnance is ammunition, weapons, maintenance. They take care of, they give us stuff that these guys use to fix things. Ordnance is all about maintaining aircraft, maintaining uh, tanks, weapons, you name it. They fix things. Transportation Corps, that's a hard one. Transportation. Transportation. Trucks, vehicles. Does the Navy, does the U.S., I'm sorry, does the Army have ships? Yes, we do. We have a number of ships. Some large roll-on, roll-off cargo ships. We also depend on the, the Navy, but to be honest, the Army has landing craft that have the big front ends that drop down like you see in, in World War II. Transportation Corps is pretty cool. If you want to go anywhere in the world, you join the Transportation Corps. Well, wasn't that one of the things that people don't realize, guys, for Desert Storm was prefaced by Desert Shield, That's right. which was, I think, six months? Because mm -hmm. we had to take the whole Army to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I mean, you imagine taking the whole American army around the world. You don't fly them. You put them on humongous ships, yeah. and it takes a long time to float a ship from Norfolk or wherever on the East Coast to Saudi Arabia. So it's pretty crazy. We did it. Yeah, we did. Well, we flew the wings off a lot of 141s, too, right. and C-70s. But you, an M1 tank, you can put one M1 tank on one... C-17. Well, that's a waste of a C-17 because there's a lot of gas to fly it back. Well, you can put hundreds of tanks on ships. And so, Transportation Corps, these are really cool. This is a great job. These guys get to go all over the world. They coordinate with all of their services and all their nations. Because when you want to land your ship in Kuwait, guess who you have to talk to? Kuwait. The Kuwaitis. You know, if you want to, one night we was, one of my, when I was assigned to, uh, I was lived in, assigned in the battalion in Vicenza, Italy. And one night, very about 3 o'clock in the morning, I was in downtown Venice, right next to it, because Venice is cool, but there's the tourist side and there's the working side. And we were downtown, this huge Navy roll-on, roll-off ship, loading all our cargo from our airborne battalion, and we were going to Turkey for a big exercise. And I thought, I'm standing here at 2 o'clock in the morning, I could see the St. Mark's Plaza, where everyone, the great you know, Venice, kind of, where all the tourists go. I thought, this is cool. I'm sitting there loading cargo on this boat and looking at the Venice, you know, downtown plaza. Like, this is neat. Judge Adam the General Corps, what do you think that is? Lawyers. Yep, no, better known as the JAG, Judge Advocate Generals. Obviously, there are not only just lawyers, but there's also technicians. There's a lot of warrant officers, legal technicians, paralegals, as they would be called, that operate in the JAG. Civil Affairs, that's a, that's a nation building group. I'm not going to get involved in that because that's really complicated. But basically, these are people that are in Afghanistan right now trying to teach people how to drill wells, build roads, uh, organize governments, uh, set up schools, uh, try to teach them how to have a court system, try to teach them how to uh, have police that aren't utterly corrupt, which is a real problem around the world. You, if you travel around the world at all, uh, you will find, you will love American police when you get back here because most anywhere else except in maybe Europe, the police just expect to be bribed. It's expected. You know, if you go into in somewhere in Africa, you just expect to be bribed. They, you, you involve yourself with the police, but you better pay them money or you're going to jail. It's just that simple. So there's a lot involved in that. Um, but civil affairs are reserved. Most of these guys and gals are reservists. They're engineers, uh, teachers, lawyers, doctors, judges in the real world. And then they are brought on active duty for a period of time to do what we call nation building which is a very controversial action by the military, but it's something that we do. And then on the far side, we have the Medical Corps. Um, obviously, we need all these people. There are actually relatively few active duty military medical people. Where are the majority of our medical people exist? Where do they exist in the, in the real world? Any ideas? Where do they be? United States. Well, no, yeah, exactly. They're in the reserves of the National Guard. <coughs> now, a lot of our, our doctors and lawyers, I mean, sir, doctors and nurses, dentists, other people with medical specialties, they operate, they have to keep themselves up to speed by doing, on a daily basis, working in Prescott or Phoenix or anywhere else, and then they get called to active duty for about six months.
They go over to Iraq and Afghanistan, ply their trade or do their specialty there, and then they come back and they relearn. We don't keep them on active duty that long because in some cases it's better for them to spend their time in the civilian world, where really the civilian world is where all the innovation is developed. But the, mil the military has a lot of involvement in that. Okay, key words. Just a few words of it real quick here. What's, we, talked about counter, we talked about military intelligence. What's counterintelligence? Uh, learning the intelligence of another country. That's one of them. Or what would also another way to be, how would we counter someone else's intelligence? What is that there? What's their job? Change our own. No, no, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to stop somebody from getting your intelligence, what are you trying to do? Oh. Or? Talk to your own guy. Fine. Another way to this is, <laughs> these are called spy catchers. They catch the other people's spies. That's a big part of counterintelligence and our intelligence group is to be able to go out. They're trying to collect intelligence on us. We're trying to collect intelligence on them. And they have counterintelligence. We have counterintelligence. So we have one guy who's trying to get information about this base or this organization or this unit. And he's trying to get pictures or he's trying to get people to help him out. Or maybe he's trying to get a spy to a source inside. And while he's trying to get that person, what's their side trying to do? They're trying to catch him doing it. They're trying to catch him. This is where the CIA operates. They operate a lot of counterintelligence overseas. Also the FBI. Where, who's, the FBI has the responsibility for counterintelligence where? Here domestically. Inside the United States of America. Technically, and I say this technically, can the CIA operate inside the United States of America? Yes. No, it is illegal. Now, having said that, maybe so. But it is illegal for the CIA to operate inside the United States of America, except in some very restricted places, usually on federal, federal land. The FBI's job is to catch foreign spies in the United States of America. And that's their job. And, that, and they, during World War I, World War II, I think they were involved in that, although it did get away a little bit. What's the word doctrine mean? This isn't just military. It's a word that we have used for a lot of things, doctrine. What does doctrine mean? All the services have it. Hmm. Okay, think about it as a Bible. What is it? It is our foundational information. It is a way we see ourselves operating. The Air Force has certain doctrine for fighter jets. It has certain doctrine for bombers. It has certain doctrine for missiles. The Navy has certain doctrine for aircraft carriers. The uh, our SEAL teams or submarines. The Army has certain doctrine for infantry guys or Apache attack helicopters. It's all the rules of how we do our business. And then unconventional is a real basic word. What does that mean? We have conventional. What's that mean? Normal. Normal. Good word. Unconventional is? Not normal. Not normal. Outside the normal realms of what we do. We call it unconventional warfare, unconventional doctrine. Another term for it is special. We have conventional operations, and we have special. special operations conducted by special operations forces, the Rangers, uh, Green Berets, Delta Force, SEAL teams, those sorts of things. Those are all areas that operate in, a, in an unconventional manner. All right, real quick. Just this, don't worry about this so much. But like, what, is, what are the major differences between the branches? I gave you three categories. What is the major differences there? What do you, what did I, how did I explain that? For, for like the CIA, that would have signal, photo, and human. Right. I don't know, air, land, and sea. That's a good one, sure. It's a good one to look at. It. Some of them deal with different environmental areas. But in terms of like, we had three categories. We had combat arms, combat support, combat service support. What, what, were the, what differentiated those organizations, those major categories? Tip the spear right. and battle one supporting that. Okay, and then we have two layers of support behind it, pushing the spear forward. And that's kind of the way we talk about it. The, the idea is that the tip of the spear is what makes contact with the enemy. Behind that, you've got combat support, giving them as much energy and support as they can. And behind that, you've got combat service support, providing more of the administrative issues, but also maintenance. When that tank breaks down on the front line battlefield, and it's a unique weird breakdown that only a guy three levels back can fix, where's he got to go? He's got to run up to where that tank is. 
He's got to fix it on the ground with bullets flying past him. So is he, in a com is he still a combat operator? Sure he is. He's still got to operate in that environment. That's not where he's supposed to be. We'd like to be able to bring the tank back to fix it so he's not crawling around getting shot at. But if he has to fix it up front, then that's what we do. We bring it, we fix him up front, you know, otherwise we try to re recover to the rear. Um, and this is kind of the, some of these about Anybody have any questions about the active army in general? Any areas that, that you, like who are the ones that have some interest in joining the army? Anybody? What was, and you were talking about aviation, right? Yes, sir. Anything about that that, that comes to mind? Uh, not off the top of my head, actually. <laughs> Do you, you have what kind of recommendations you have for getting into West Point? Oh, uh, West Point. Do real well on the SAT and ACTs. And I, I, I say this, and every high school principal and counselor has a fit when I say this, but how important is your GPA? Really? Not very. Not very. Why? Because you can cheat the whole time. What's that? You can cheat the whole time. Well, not cheat necessarily, but... If you are at a university or West Point and you're looking at somebody's SAT or uh, GPA from Prescott High School and it's a 4.5 GPA, what's that mean to you? Their schools are geniuses. Maybe. Or maybe the school just grades really easily. If you look at a guy who's got a, or a gal who's got a GPA of 3.75 in South Texas, what's that tell you? It's more difficult. That, that school probably grades not as easy. Maybe. How do you know? You don't. There's no way to tell. So what do you use to compare those two? SAT, ACT, a national test. I was a professor of military science, or senior ROTC, at the University of Washington in Seattle for four years before I retired. And I handed out hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarship. And we learned very quickly that GPAs really didn't mean much. I could get a guy with a 4.5 GPA, and on the SATs, he scored, or the SAT, or ACTs, he scored a 20. That's not very good. What does that tell me about his GPA? Didn't mean much. But I might have somebody who scored a 28 on the ACTs and his GPA was a 3.75. What's that tell me? That he maybe studied really hard. Well, you could have somebody that's really good in school and maybe really good in class, but is just a bad test taker. They that's, actually know what they're doing. I mean that part where we find out what you know? That's my life right there. I'm a bad test taker. I understand about that. But you know what? Welcome to the rest of your life. What are you going to be doing for the rest of your life? Yes. Yeah, you better get good at it. I'm sorry, I hate to say it, but nobody cares. Is that college professor walks in, lectures you for out, and walks out and gives you a test? What does he expect? A. You better pass, or he's going to flunk you. It's that simple. They don't care. I, mean, I really don't mean to be rude about it, but at the university level, teaching is an irritation in most professions. Why? They just want to study and research. Well, they want to research and publish is what they want to do. Most classes are taught by the professors or by graduate students. Graduate students, absolutely. If a professor can talk his graduate student and teach his class, that's who's teaching the class. Most, most 102 level classes are taught by graduate students. The professor walks in from time to time, and it depends if he likes to teach or not, but the most time it's taught by graduate students. And do they care whether you pass or not? No. No, they're taking their classes. They're trying to get their masters and their PhDs. So it's always been, it's, it, it always tickles me, and I don't mean this in a, in a mean way, but when I talk to public education folks, after spending four years at a university, it is important to understand that high school, your first 12 years is going to be significantly different than your last four or ever, how far you go up along in college. The universities don't care what your learning style is. Well, this isn't the way I learn. I don't care. The professor walks in, talks for an hour, walks out. You better learn it or you flunk out. And I hate to say this is also kind of rude, but how many freshmen flunk out of a four-year institution in their freshman year? About 50%. Why is that? It's too fast-paced. They're just not ready for it. Let's say you're a good student in high school and you don't try very hard. You don't have to work at it. And then you go to high college and you've got to work your butt off and you've never learned how to do that. Who teaches you how to do that? Yourself. Either yourself or nobody or you flunk out. So when I talk about ACTs, SATs, it's a long circle, getting back to the original question. You need to make sure that you do take tests well. I hate to say it, nobody cares whether you're a good test taker or not. They want to know the grade. You want to demonstrate what you know. If you cannot demonstrate what you know on a test, how are you going to demonstrate what you know to your employer or that battalion commander or that squadron commander? Well, I'm sorry, sir, I don't take tests very well. 
Uh, There's 20 other people out there to do it. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I've told them all the story, <laughs> but it's great to hear you say it, is the fact that, you know, 30 years ago, when they didn't have standardized tests, you didn't have bubbles, okay, the first generation of kids that came through, maybe they didn't know how to fill in a bubble. We, when we were kids, we were taught a whole class how to fill out a bubble. Yeah. Because nobody had done it before. And so I could understand some up here maybe screwed up the bubbles and made a zero. But your, your generation, my kids, who I've got a son in college, you've been doing it your whole life. There's, there's just no excuse. I mean, there's 20 other people that can take tests if you don't whine and say you can't take a test. Yeah. You, you just got to learn how to do it because that's how we measure it. Whether you like it or not, whether that's fair or not, that's my favorite four-letter word, by the way, fair. What is fair to you may not be fair to me. What may be fair to him may not be fair to her. I don't really like the word very much. I do like the word equal. I can deal with equal. I can't deal with fair. Fair is a matter of opinion. You may not think the professor's fair. Do you think he really cares? <laughs> no, he's getting paid. And if you flunk out, do they really care? No, because they've already got your money, don't they? This is the last free education you get, folks. After you leave high school, guess what? Education becomes really expensive. It costs you an arm and a leg. You know, just try to check out a community college or what it costs to go to ASU or any other school. I did, my daughter just graduated from college last year. Whew. My you know, retirement fund took a significant hit. Now, she went to BYU, and she's a good student, and she graduated, and she did a great job. But, you know, it's enormously expensive. It just, it's just, and, and that's the, the measure, in many cases, of what you can do. Now, yes, Bill Gates did not complete college, but he was at Harvard when he dropped out, and he's doing fine. So it's one of those weird uh, dichotomies that we talk about from time to time. But the bottom line is, if you want to go into it, become a commissioned officer in the active army, you have to go to college or have a bachelor's degree of some form. Do you have to go to the academies? No. The majority of officers in the military are not academy graduates. They are ROTC graduates or OCS graduates. As a matter of fact, the academies only provide less than a third, I think. I'm an ROTC, girl to Kemper, went to college, and got in after college. That all happens now. And I, I'm a, I am actually, took me two tries, to be honest. This is my quick Army story about myself. I graduated from Coronado High School down in Scottsdale, Arizona in 1971. Yes, that does make me older than dirt, so it's one of those things. I went to ASU for a semester and a half, and guess what I did? Party. Party. I had a great time <laughs> and flunked everything. I left college with a 1.2 GPA. Oh. Yeah, but I was in ROTC at the time, Army ROTC, and I joined the Army as an enlisted guy because at least I was smart enough to go, okay, this is not working. This 1.2 GPA thing is not going to work very well for me. So I joined the Army. I enlisted in the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, was a private, an infantryman, as I am now, and I found I liked it. I found I had a knack for it. Both the physical and the intellectual side, they blended well in me. I'm not somebody that's just behind a desk very well. i got to be up and moving around. I'm sure I'm ADHD in some form or fashion, but it worked out for me. I don't know, it just works out. It went on to become, I went down when the Ranger Battalions first formed in 1974 after the really time. I was an original member of the 1st Ranger Battalion in Savannah, Georgia, as a young, as a young Spec 4 corporal. And that one. Went on to become a Buck Sergeant, or an E5, as a Ranger Master parachutist, I got out, came back to ASU, older and wiser. I had joined the Army, spent four years enlisted, came back in, I was about 22 years old. Guess what my GPA was when I, when I graduated? 2.8. No, 3.5. <laughs> but that was adding in the 1.2 that I came back with. When you've got to overcome a 1.2, trust me, it takes a while to get your GPA back up. But I, mean, I made the dean's list, and why was that? Because you didn't try. I had matured. I had grown up, and just from my experience in the last 13 years of dealing with high school students, the majority of you are not prepared to go to college right out of high school. And I know that is heresy in public education, but it is the fact. At 18 years old, the majority of you, and I'm not saying it, but the majority, you need to get out, get your feet wet, do something, get active, be involved, learn something. Have some experiences. Appreciate when you go back to college what this is all about. Because yes, it's, it's a weird statistic and it's very generalized, but when I was at the University of Washington, we talked about it all the time. 
50% of all freshmen that go to a four-year university, like if you go to ASU as a freshman, 50% flunk out the first year. So what's, what's a better way to go, by the way? First two years you should go to? Maybe junior college. Junior college. Absolutely. Why not? Is it cheaper? Yes. Yes. Are the classes smaller? No. Actually, in many cases, the professors care more. They're more engaged. It's like a super level high school, but it's a transition from this to the four year institution. I strongly recommend it. I made my daughter go for the first year to MCC College down in Mesa, Arizona, before I let her go to BYU. I wanted her to get that transitional step. It worked out fine for her. But there's this, there's this mindset in public education high school, college. I, I disagree. Someone who has been to college, who's taught for four years at a university, I'm always usually when I have these arguments with counselors, it's people who've never worked at the university. I was a department chair for four years at a major state university, University of Washington, Seattle, and I know from where I speak. So think about it. I'm not saying you're not the one or one of those that is or isn't the one. You may do very well, and some people do. But it is a, it is a very important factor in your consideration and your decision making about where you go on in terms of the services. If you wish to go in the military, that's fine. Consider it. It's a career. If you wish to go on to college, and I come from a family of lawyers. I didn't want to be a lawyer. My dad's a lawyer. My brother's a lawyer. My dad taught law at Arizona State University for a number of years. The last thing I wanted to be was a lawyer. But every freshman class I used to have, I'd ask the kids when they'd walk in, what are you all going to be? What would you all say? Doctors and lawyers, right? Do you even know what it'd be? A lawyer is the most boring job on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> too much reading, too much talking. That's what I do, anyways. So, these are the branches. Any other questions about the Army or secondary education that may take you on to a career in the military? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, is it true that you don't have to be in the Army to go into Ranger School? No, that is not true. Now, you can be a foreign service. If you go join the Canadian Army, we do have rangers that, that almost every class has foreign soldiers in it. They come from other services, um, other nations. We do have Navy guys occasionally to go to the ranger school. A uh, few Air Force guys, very rare, but a few of the enlisted facts. Where's your ranger pen? Or oh, ranger tab right there. That is. That's my ranger tab. That's what you get when you finish ranger school. Ranger school is, uh, is not brutal. Have you all watched some of the, they have, it's called Surviving the Cut on TV. Um, they show SEALs, they show PJs, which are pararescue for the Air Force. Um, they show Ranger School, they show Special Forces, some accession classes. It's all different. The SEALs probably are the most, and I admit this, it's probably the most physically demanding accessions and training there is in the military. But it is not, and I hate to say this, particularly mentally challenging. They just grind the hell out of those guys. Very demanding, very stressful and physically, and some of the mental stuff, certainly water stuff. If you're not comfortable in water, you don't want to be a SEAL. You have to be very comfortable underwater and around water. But there's not a lot of mental aspect to it. A special Forces, and in the Army, Special Forces and Ranger School are both physically but much more mentally challenging. You're put, you get, you've been having slept for three days. They drag you up out of the ground and say, okay, you're now in charge of this patrol. You now have to make a plan. You have to lead them down the road. You have the next 24 hours, you've got to take them to a, pretend to make an assault on an objective, and you've got to lead them all the way through. And these guys are all as tired and as exhausted as you are. The last 12 days of ranger school, you get one meal a day, and you are starving to death. But you know what? You're given a meal, a chance to eat an extra meal and get an hour's sleep, guess what you'll take? To sleep, absolutely, in a heartbeat, which is really bad because they do that to you, and then you don't eat, and what happens? More tired. You get more tired. We, have to, we used to have to it's like slap guys in the last three or four days of ranger school, wake them up and shove food down their face. Because this guy was carrying the radio. This guy was carrying the machine gun. We couldn't afford him to just fall apart on us. And then if he did, they'd just take him away, and somebody else had to drag the damn thing around, and I didn't want to do that. Radio weighs 25 pounds. I'm not carrying that damn thing. <laughs> you better wake up and carry the radio. I did it last patrol. But ranger school is very stressful in those environments because you have to be a leader. Nowhere in SEAL team schools you have to learn how to do that. Uh, PJ school is very similar. There's a lot of stress, but that's highly technical. Most PJs 
they're like almost registered nurses, they're paramedics, highly involved medical science. Special forces, you have to be both a leader, but you have highly competent and technical skill sets. Medical guys, communications, you have to learn Morse code. Uh, the engineer guys have to do math in their heads to figure out charges and breaching and explosions. Very complicated. That's where it, it separates. You, sometimes you see on these blogs, oh, the Rangers are tougher than the Special Forces, than the, than the Delta, than the SEALs. It's comparing apples and bananas. It's not even a valid comparison. But Ranger School is only for you, military service people because of the level of injury. Usually about 260 guys start a class, about 120, 130 pass. Usually half of those are injuries. Long story of why you get injured. Some of it's just twisting ankles, tearing up knees. Uh, there are other reasons why you get injured, but that's part of it. You get, answer back the question? Right there? Oh, I was just curious, because you said you were a professor. Do you have your doctorate? No, I do not have a master's degree. I have two masters. But one of the reasons, one of the requirements for the University of Washington was to accept me as a professor, was at least to have a master's degree. But it's very hard for us on active duty to get PhDs. My dad had one, uh, really in political science. My brother a, has a law degree. But when you're on active duty, much of our education is done after hours or on weekends. I got my master's when I was going to command General Staff College. So I'd go to school all day in the Army, and then I'd drive over to Platte City, Missouri, and be in class another three hours. And then every weekend for a year, on Saturday, I'd go to class for, two, for eight hours. And I got my master's while I was taking command general staff college. That's very similar to a lot of guys. But the officer corps, all of all the services, is expected to be highly educated. That's something else we get from the British. The British expected the officer corps to be well-educated, advanced degrees. Outside of academia and probably the medical and the legal branches, the U.S. Army officer corps is the most highly educated group in the nation. Because you won't make much rank, they don't really tie it to education, but you won't get promoted to lieutenant colonel or colonel if you don't have a master's degree, for example. It's just expected. It's not really said that way, but that's kind of the intent. And then we do, when we go to universities, um, they'll give us a little, like they would expect us to have PhDs, and some guys do get it. Guys who go to West Point or some of the academies, they do are given, actually, a, sort of what they call a extended duty, and they'll just let you go to a school for two years to get your PhD and they'll pay for it. But that can be a career problem. If you take yourself out of the mainstream of being an army officer as an infantryman, if I'm not leading infantry or commanding soldiers or dealing with that, then I'm kind of out of the mainstream. And the guys who are doing that are more likely to make colonel and general up the length than necessarily to be the, the academic geniuses that may or may not have a bearing directly on my military career. That's the end of this class. Could I tell them why don't you dismiss everybody, please? Right. Woo! Ten up! Dismissed. Shake and bake.